What's going on today, guys? Let's talk about aftermarket pricing. I'm gonna show you what's in my pocket today. I've been carrying this the last two days. This is my Sleesh Bowie from Spider Co. I uh, discontinued a couple years ago. Prices ran crazy on the aftermarket and uh, leads us into our topic today. And then I've paired it up with my 92 GEC Talon. Look at the teeners on that thing. So this was produced in 2014. You can tell because of the last two digits on the tang. This is an oldie, but a goodie. I'll tell you that. Um, but let's talk about aftermarket pricing because both of these knives have just about doubled or did double on the aftermarket. And uh, I have thoughts on that, but as a forewarning, I am no economist. This is just my thoughts. I'm not well read on the subject. This is just how I feel about it, um, which is, you know, may have value to you, may not. But if I say something real crazy and something you don't agree with, um, put it in the comments below, which I'm sure maybe it uh, won't resonate with everybody. But again, these are just my opinions and I am a logical person. So if somebody has something in the comments below and I read it, uh, it's possible, you know, I see things differently. So I invite that sort of conversation as long as we keep it reasonable because this could be a hot subject. We're going to try to cover everything. Um, I have a few notes here, but they're not like detailed. So we're just off the cuff kind of riffing. We're just vibing, bro. Just vibing. Okay. So what's the good, bad, and ugly? We'll start with the good. Uh, in my opinion, the good of having a high aftermarket price on an item such as this or this GEC. If this knife cost me, let's just round it up. It didn't, but let's say it cost me $100. The aftermarket runs it up, let's say within two years, this thing's $150. Within five years, now it's $200, right? Within 10 years, this is a 10-year-old knife now. Uh, they run it up to... Um, double are people pulling right up next to us so not double triple let's say this is a 300 dollars knife 10 years later and i don't know if that's true or not i'm just saying um at some point it does feel gross and i don't know exactly what that point is but at some point it does feel gross because once you get into those types of profit margins you're going to have people who don't even really like knives. They don't even like GECs for real. They just see them as a profit vehicle, you know, and that annoys us collectors because at some point now the 2024 models, and I'm not just talking GECs. I just, this is what um, my collecting brain sees the most is because I'm the most interested in traditional knives. So, you could substitute GEC with almost anything. Custom makers are gonna be a little bit different. We might get into that, but in my opinion, there's good and bad to that because when the aftermarket holds value on something, that means we have consumer confidence in buying the item, right? To me, when I see this brand new and it's $100 and I'm kind of interested, it's a no brainer for me to grab because I know it's gonna hold its value. If it's not for me, if I carry and use it, uh, if I just want to put it in the collection, enjoy it for however I want to enjoy it, I know that it's going to have value later. You know, it's not just thrown away. So I think that's a good thing. That keeps your brand strong. Uh, if I had a brand of knives, I would like for the aftermarket to be strong on it for that very reason. The confidence in the buyers is everything. So if you're holding your value, that usually means that you're delivering a great product at a good price, you know? So if GEC themselves start charging $300 for the knife, well now that's just Benchmade situation, right? It feels gross and it doesn't feel like 
you're getting your value per dollar. And it really feels gross in comparison to what they used to charge. You know, everything's slowly, steadily climbing. We already did that video. Um, but there is a point where it feels gross. And I think everybody has their own individual feeling. Like, let's say you missed out on the drop like this knife at $100. We're going to make things even. Let's see you have it on eBay saved. Somebody's selling an instant uh, purchase for 150 that feels a little gross, right? 135 is like, all right, well, I'll spend the extra $35 just to have the item. But when you're at 150, you're like, oh, I don't know. And then when they double in price, the $100 knife is now $200. That's definitely icky territory. <laughs> and I... It almost like cringes you to the core because knives are so near and dear to us. But this discussion could apply to anything like collectible Nike shoes or collectible fountain pens or clothes or anything collectible, right? You could apply that to that. The people who are actually enthusiasts and love the object for what it is in a knife and they want to use it feel grossed out that there's people who are like using them like cheap whores to make money for lack of better term, you know, and that's what it feels like. And I think that's why it cringes me personally to the core, <clears throat> but I understand it because there's all types of people in this world. There are some people who love knives just as much as you or me. And they know that this hundred dollar GC could be flipped overnight for $200. And they know if they can grab three of them, well, now they could have a free knife and also take their family out to dinner. Is that their fault? Kind of, because now they're taking it away from people who actually wanted to carry and use it. I personally, I'm, I'm not mad at them. But again, there's a territory where it feels gross, where if somebody has bots... And if you don't know what a bot is, it's a computer script program that I don't understand it completely, but I know what they do. They can keep refreshing the screen. They have all your information that will just have a script that puts all your information in there and they can grab it and it keeps refreshing. Jump, 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 jump. And then they go live, right? The second they go live, you got maybe 50 items for Blade HQ. I, I have no idea. What's that car doing? Either way, um, they have 50 items that go live. Bots grab the 50 within a minute and a half, 30 seconds. They're all gone. Um, people just do whatever they want in parking lots. But anyways, that's what a bot does. It grabs the item, puts it in the cart, will sometimes check it out. And sometimes they may have 50 bots that are purchasing. Jung, jung, jung. And that's how one person might be able to show up on um, eBay and have 10 of them. You know, maybe the bots grab 10 of them. That feels gross, you know, because it feels like, yeah, there were some people who honestly wanted that knife. And now they can't have it because now the aftermarket overnight ran the price up on them. That's gross, you know. So... There's, there's positives and there's negatives. I think that there's definitely not an even scale there. I think it's more weighted towards negative. Like, it would be nice if everybody just kept things reasonable. So, I'm going to give away a little tip if you're specifically looking for uh, GECs or any other desirable traditional knife. Um look at blade forms i'll have a link to their for sale section you have to do your own research and buyer beware because it's easy to get an account and it's only like 25 or 50 dollars to sell so just make sure they've had their account a while and make sure that they're reputable but for the most part i have never been burned on it but that doesn't mean that you can't i haven't buy traded or sold on blade forms in a long time but there are a couple good old boys on there who maybe spent $165 
and they're selling it for $165 or a little bit of a loss or a little bit of a markup, maybe $200. They're not $300 on eBay, you know? So, so check those out if you're interested in specific, you know, to GEC is what I'm talking about. But anyways, so let's move on. This is way longer than I thought that I could talk about aftermarket pricing. And we haven't even got into, um, the like custom maker side of things. And I'm gonna briefly touch on that because I didn't plan on this being such a long video. This is a topic that could have um, books written on it. And I certainly am not the economist, you know, educated person that you need to listen to. I'm just telling you how I feel. Um, in my opinion, custom makers need that strong aftermarket because if they didn't have that, again, the consumer confidence goes down and their knives are not desirable anymore. You know, if, if any day of the week you could go out and grab a Kirby Lambert for exactly table price, let's say it's $700 now, they don't, f like, what's the, like, you want that aftermarket to be strong. And the, the point is because nobody's afraid to buy that $700 knife when as soon as they buy it off the table, now they know that they can sell it for $800, $850, right? I think the gross part of that is where you see that $800 knife being snatched up and then being flipped for $1,500 overnight. That feels gross. There's a point there where it just feels gross. And I know that's what some dealers do. Dealers may go to lotteries and they may put in all their friends, all their family, and boom, overnight after a show, you've got one dealer has like 10 of the lottery knives and they're all marked up, like way up, right? That's, as a maker, in my opinion, that would feel gross. And I only know that because I got a small, very small feeling of that when um, I was doing a lot of modification work and I had somebody who had a scale made. I'm not gonna make it specific because it just, we're not needed to do that. Made a scale for them, they liked it. They come back and bought another one bought another one. And then like on the third one, I start giving bro pricing. My mistake, right? You shouldn't do that. Um, but I did. Bro pricing. Well, now they want to order like another one. You're like, all right. Well, now we're just going to stay at that price. Well, I made about five scales for this person. Come to find out, I was charging, let's say, going to keep it easy, $100 right? I had to hand make it, had to buy the material, make sure everything fit right, grind the material that it was and put my work into it and just make it exactly where I'd be proud to put my name on it. You know, and I got paid. That's, I, that's not a cheap price. That wasn't an unfair price. And, uh, was just what stuff was going for. Come to find out that individual was getting them, reposting them for $150. They were making almost as much profit as I was without doing anything other than just sending an email to me, float the $100 to send it to me, and then they would make $150 off of it. And that's not bad on them. If your item is underpriced, then maybe increase your prices a little bit, you know, but to me, it felt gross to charge more than the hundred dollars because a hundred dollars was already good profit. And that's why I'm probably not a great businessman as far as that, because you should ride that edge right up to the, the edge. Although I still don't think I could do that because you want that aftermarket. You want the hype. You want the desirability the of people 
wanting your item and also knowing that your item holds value. That's very important in any collectible item. So it just feels gross when you cross that line of, well, now you made more than the maker. If the list price was $800 from a maker, it was bought at the table and immediately it's flipped for $1,600. We're at the gross point and i can't tell you what your gross point is but i think that's the problem that you see is people are so um upset me included of the aftermarket on some of these items because you feel like they're being snatched to be used like a cheap hooker and just to make a profit on the item that we enjoy but i can promise you this stuff's happening with shoes do in the knife world, we care that the shoes got bought for $100 from a bot and now they're going up for $300 on stock X. It doesn't affect me, so I don't care. But I'm, you know, logical enough to realize that in the sneaker game, that's probably feeling gross too. Although, who are we taking advantage of? Big companies. And then there's a whole subculture of people who are speculate buying. So, Sneakers are different. I'm not going to talk sneakers, but um, speculate buying items like sprint runs and they buy 10 of them and they hoard 10 of them, you know, and then sometimes <laughs> Spyderco will reissue that sprint run or whatever it is as a <coughs> exclusive to a dealer, right? And they'll just change the scale on it. So yes, that knife was a one-off run, but now that uh, blade steel is being produced and the paramilitary too, and instead of the carbon fiber handle, it has something else. You know what I mean? But that's funny. And, and I'm saying that because do you guys remember when this went discontinued? And I told everybody for years when they were available, I think they're only available for like two or three years. Grab you one of these. This is one of Spider Co's top three knives that they've ever made. In my opinion, the size, the fit and finish, the no hump here made it really unique, especially at the time. Um, the cutting edge, how it comes all the way down to the base of the handle with no choil. The design, just everything about this knife, the lockup, was just incredible. It's still centered. It's, it's an awesome knife. Um, Overnight, you know, within like three months of being discontinued, these things shot way up to like $600. And then Spyderco re-released them just about a few years ago. But it was like a blue handle. And the blade was not quite this polished, um, tumbled. It was like a satin finish. And they still went like that overnight from the dealer. And then they were flipped for six or $700 on the aftermarket. Now, I don't know what they're doing on the aftermarket now. But in my personal opinion, I feel that a mass-produced factory knife, like these are kind of weird when you get into aftermarket pricing territory because Spyderco could just decide to release this knife again. Well, I mean, what's stopping them from doing that? And... I wish that they would. I don't care if the aftermarket crashes on this knife. I'm never going to sell mine. But I'm sure there's going to be some people that are like, oh man, I paid $600 for that knife. And now they just re re reissued it. And now you can just go buy 10 of them if you want. They're going to keep producing them. Like there's, it's just one of their lineups now. I personally think that's awesome. They should do that. I personally feel... GEC, I like that they're exclusive to this model, but what if you up production numbers to double? Might not be possible, though. I mean, they're using ancient uh, machinery, and I'm not sure now, but I know some of the machines that they were using and probably still use are old. They're old. They may not want to make double the amount and they may not want to increase the price double on their knives. So good on them, but that leaves us with this aftermarket thing that 
when it gets to the profit margins that it's at, buying when they release to selling on the aftermarket, when you start to get that 50% to 100% profit margins, well, now you're attracting all kinds of people. There are people who are just in it to make money. Beanie babies, right? Um, except for these are useful items. I don't think they're going to crash like Beanie Babies, but you know, they could, I don't know. Um, they haven't yet. I made a video about 10 years ago saying I, if somebody give me, I forgot what it was like $5,000, I could easily invest that $5,000 into knives and I could hand you back six to seven to $8,000 within a few years. Um, I don't know if that's the case now, but back 10 years ago, I could have easily delivered on that promise. But anyways, I see the good and bad, but I do recognize that it feels mostly gross. Absolutely. I'm glad that they're not making um, the profits themselves. Does that make sense? I'm glad that GEC is not charging $300 for this knife. And I understand that that aftermarket is always going to be there, the aftermarket pricing. It's just going to be a thing you have to deal with, like it or not. Um, but it does take away and it sucks some of the fun out for us people who actually want to carry and use them. Because now, even if you do snag this knife at the $100 that it was when it releases, and you just honest to God got one. And I've had a couple people email me saying, hey, uh, that Barlow with the saw cut, I was able to get one like at the price. So it wasn't on bots. That's awesome. You know, um, what was I going to say? I don't know. I had a thought that I was going to go there, but one of the things about free ball in your videos is you just can lose your train of thought that fast. It's been long enough. Um, but I'm glad that GEC is not charging the $300, you know, because that feels gross too. If they used to charge this and now they're charging way more. I don't know. That's it, guys. Just keep in mind, when you start buying these factory, like even sprint runs and stuff, you can get stuck with them. I just, you know, I, I the only way to stop it is for people to not buy them at those crazy marked up prices. And that's not going to happen because there's people... Again, we've already talked about it on the Benchmade video, who that extra $150 is literally a candy bar to them. It doesn't even, the $150, it doesn't matter to them. There are some people that can't afford it and can't afford it and will still buy it because they want the item so bad that they'll just buy it and then they'll have it. And then there's honestly some people who were like, I like knives. The knife was already $150. I don't care if it's $300. That's not anything. You know, um, money is very subjective to some folks. And also the, the value amount. Some people will buy that $300 knife knowing that it's only a $150 knife, knowing that they're overpaying the $300. But because the aftermarket is so strong that they know they can have it sit in their collection and maybe it's a $325 knife in a few years. You know, so I, I get it. It's a very complicated subject and in specific, uh, GEC, it's not that simple to be just make more knives. Like they're a limited factory hand making their knives with people who have been doing it for many years. You can't just have that person. If they're already working 40 hours, work 80 hours, right? You can't just have those machines that are already running, you know, I don't, who knows? They might have a night shift and a day shift. I have no idea. Um, you can't just get more of those hundred year old machines and just have them and just ramp up production and everything. So what's the solution? Should, should we be asking GEC to be charging more? Probably not. You know, if they feel like they're getting what they need to get for them, it's like me selling that scale for the hundred dollars. Um, can you be mad at the guy who went and spent it, you know, sold it for $150? Not really, you know, makes you think, but either way.
I'm out of here, guys. I appreciate you hanging out. These are some beauties right here. And we didn't even get into custom makers too much. That's probably a subject for another video. What do you think about this pairing? Good Lord. All right, guys. I appreciate you. See ya.